I keenly recall my first introduction to the world of fear and hunger, and I'll be honest, it was not a great one. See, ever since I was a teenager growing up in small town Scotland, I've been into extreme forms of art and entertainment. I guess the seeds were planted when my dad first started showing me really violent movies when I was very young. Stuff like Goodfellas, A Clockwork Orange, Robocop and Blade. Don't know why he thought it was appropriate to show me that sort of stuff when I was like 11, but I thank him for it. Then, when I was around 13, I discovered the heavier genres of metal, this underground treasure trove of fascinating, fantastic, and in many cases, extreme bands. Ranging from your technical death metal titans like Necrophagist and Spawn of Possession, your brutal death metal badasses like Defeated Sanity and Cryptopsy, your gore grind ghouls like Regurgitate and Last Days of Humanity, and everything in between. And around about when I was in my mid to late teens, I'd also eagerly search out extreme or disturbing movies. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has at one point found themselves typing into Google things like all time most disturbing movies and sickest films ever made, etc. Putting me onto gems like Men Behind the Sun, Sallow, Snowtown, The House That Jack Built, and numerous other abhorrent horrors and thrillers, the kind of films that just stick with you. Throughout my life, I've even had far darker phases where I've sought out the real deal on your more unmentionable websites, sitting in my bedroom watching gore and death videos, usually up until the point where I'd see something particularly horrific that would leave me depressed and afraid for a fortnight, though I'm glad to say that I don't frequent those sorts of sites anymore. But why did I watch this sort of stuff? Well, I did have a load of philosophical mumbo-jumbo wrote out in my script here, but I think that I'd be straying from the main subject of the video over much, so let's just say I'm really interested in sick shit. I am uniquely compelled by the extreme, by the most hardcore possible forms of entertainment that I'm legally allowed to watch slash play, which brings us onto fear and hunger. Before I carry on any further, if you find yourself enjoying this video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And please also allow me to give the biggest possible thanks to my brilliant patrons for supporting this channel. Just as I used to scour Google for disturbing movie and book recommendations, last year I found myself doing the same for games. Because to be honest, I really don't think there's a lot of really disturbing games out there. Oh, there are horrors and shooters with lots of blood and guts in them. Sure, oh yeah. But who cares? Gotta do something special to arouse me. There have been a few though. The first four Silent Hill games for sure, and then there's Devotion by Red Candle Games, and who could forget the cynical excessiveness of the violence found in Manhunt. But I never quite found what I was looking for, and this does make a lot of sense. I mean with movies, shows and books, you're not controlling the violence, you're just watching or reading it. And I think the whole control and virtually taking part aspect of games really does add an awkward and uncomfortable element to it, and is why we don't see more video games that go there, in the way that films can. Even so, back at the beginning of 2023, I tried googling most disturbing ever games, and upon clicking onto some reddit thread, I saw someone recommend a PC game created an RPG maker called Fear and Hunger, claiming it to be insanely cruel, hmm. violent, hmm. and sadistic. Now you're talking my language. And with heavy Berserk influences, I love Berserk. And they also mentioned something about it being really, really hard. Yeah, 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 out of the way, kid. I've beaten Dark Souls. I think I know what I'm doing. The sequel, Fear and Hunger 2, Termina, had just been released the month before, but of course I wanted to play this one first, and it was chip as cheaps on Steam too. Nice. Well, I did try Fear and Hunger, but I did not have a good time. In fact, my experience was very similar to my earliest experiences with Dark Souls. My channel is of course primarily Souls focused, but my first foray into Dark Souls was very much fraught with frustration, outrage and disbelief. This belief that a game could be so hard, so cruel, so bloody unfair, all oh, the humanity. In fact, I even went so far as to sell my copy of Dark Souls after dying one too many times to those infernal bloody bell gargoyles. Not unlike what I ended up doing with fear and hunger, only instead of getting nailed by gargoyles, I found myself getting repeatedly savaged by vicious dogs, penetrated by engorged guards, and whipped by 
whatever the hell these things are supposed to be. What the hell is this? I remember asking to myself, alone in my room. Where do I go? Why do the enemies do such insane damage? Oh great, there goes my arms, now I can't hold any weapons. Hey, what does that status effect mean? Oh, it means I just die a few screens later. Why can I literally die from losing a coin flip? How do I save? Oh look, a bed. Let's save. Oh look, an enemy. Now I can't save. This game was breaking all the rules and I did not like it. I hated the unfairness. I hated having to replay the beginning over and over and over again. And most of all, I hated dying because I couldn't figure out how not to die. I was very intrigued and compelled by the horrific monster designs and the overwhelming atmosphere of dread and oppressive darkness. But Jesus, pleases, I could not get to grips with the gameplay for love nor money. And it pissed me off. In fact, fear and hunger pissed me off so much that it became the first game I ever refunded on Steam. Because I believe that first and foremost, games are supposed to be fun. That is the one thing that any game must, without exception, get right. It's got to be fun. And folks, I did not have any goddamn fun. But it could not be denied that I was still very much intrigued by the world of Fear and Hunger. I, like countless others, have spent many hours watching Fear and Hunger videos on YouTube, listening to people's interpretation of the lore, seeing all the different character interactions, seeing all the different enemy designs, each more horrific and twisted than the last, and even vicariously enjoying watching other people wrestle and grapple with the game's mechanics because I simply couldn't play the fucking thing myself. You could even say I considered Fear and Hunger to be the best game I couldn't stand, the game I hated to love. However, after watching all this gameplay, eventually, inevitably temptation got the better of me. Despite myself, I craved another bite of this delightfully rotten apple. And oh look, there is a sequel, and some folks are even saying it's more beginner friendly than the first game, though some others claimed it was actually a good deal harder. Well folks, as of the time of writing, I have finished Fear and Hunger 2 Termina four times. Twice with ending A, once with ending B, and once with ending C, using a different character each time. And what I'll say at this point is that the nature and enjoyment of my experience with this game shifted drastically from when I started playing it up until now. Drastically. But from the beginning, when I was having about as bad a time as one can have when playing a game, to the end where I was having about as good a time as one can have, I was always consistent on one thing. Fear and Hunger 2 is a fascinating game and I'd like to make a video about it. But well, what's that? Every other fucking YouTuber and their mum has already made a video about these games? I've missed the boat by about 8 months? Well, I'm making one anyway. What's your opinion on the matter, Smudge? I don't care, we can barely understand your accent anyway. Now let me sleep, bitch. Fear and Hunger 2 takes place in the same universe as the first game, except many hundreds of years into the future. In fact, the universe it takes place in is heavily based on our own, except with differences. For one, while the layout of the world's continent seems to be identical, different countries, unions and empires are at play, many of which are based on real life powers, like how Edo, where the character Tanaka is from, is based on Japan. And then there's the Eastern Union, which is based on the Soviet Union. And most notably insofar as Termina is concerned, there's also the Bremen Empire, which is heavily based on 1930s and 40s Germany. Yes, that Germany. Even the level of technological advancement is, with one massive exception, largely on par with what our world's level of technology was back in those times, and the same seems to apply to things like fashion and architecture, at least as far as we can see, because the game does entirely take place in a town called Preheval, the capital of Bohemia, a small state caught in the middle of a great war between the world's two great superpowers, the Bremen Empire and the Eastern Union, which again is analogous to the Second World War. So far, everything's somewhat grounded and understandable, but like I said, this game is set in the same dismal universe as the first one, and indeed, there are dark and occult forces at play here. There were a whole bunch of different endings to Fear and Hunger 1, with some aspects of them being considered canon, while others are very much contradictory to one another and to events and conditions which we can see have occurred or will occur in this game's setting. 
but one very significant event that definitely happened was the cruel creation of an ascended god, the god of fear and hunger, born from a human child. Just as the dark priests in the dungeons of fear and hunger said, they will create an idol out of our fears, and that is indeed what so horribly occurs in ending A of that game, ushering in what came to be known as the Cruel Age, where mankind learned to adapt and evolve, harnessing their hardship into a driver of never before seen progress and innovation for the next several hundred years, up to the game's present day, where the worship of deities, be they old, new or ascended, is more and more seen as an outdated superstition, at least in most civilised parts of the world, because as we see in Fear and Hunger 2's setting, worship, ceremony and sacrifice are still very much at play here in Preheval, right out in the open too. And that brings us on to the beginning of the game, which occurs right after the end of the Second Great War between Bremen and the Eastern Union, which ended very soon after Bremen took over the town of Preheval. Just like the first game, Fear and Hunger 2 offers you a selection of different characters to play as, twice as many as the first game in fact, for double the trouble. Don't know about you, but I got pretty damn excited when I saw all of them here, all wonderfully drawn with different visual personalities and backstories, and with a range of different skills and specialties too. For clarity, I haven't played as every character yet, but I have done ending A as Marco and as Olivia, ending B as Osa, and then ending C as Marina. As for Levi, Dan, Abella and Karen, whilst I haven't picked any of them as my main before, I have at some point recruited each of them into my party, and so I've got a decent enough idea of who can and can't do what at this point in my illustrious fear and hunger career. There are other main characters in the game that the creator Miro Haverinen, apologies if I'm not saying that correctly, had originally intended to add in as fully playable characters, but I believe that will no longer be happening or at least be very unlikely to be getting another entire 8, and no bloody wonder. I haven't mentioned it yet, but both Fear and Hunger games were almost exclusively made by one guy over in Finland, which, after studying and playing these games as much as I have now, especially the second, I find fucking mind-blowing. Yes, these are RPG Maker games which largely have basic graphics, but at the same time they have undeniable depth and complexity, and I honestly find it to be just as impressive that one guy made this as I was when I found out that Celeste was only made by two people. Same with Hollow Knight. Anyway, now that I've figuratively sucked Miro's d a bit, very first thing you do with any character is play out their history, letting you learn their backstory and make certain important decisions to determine what item and skills you will start out with. The game gives you an option to skip these, but never skip them. For a start, the decisions you make play a massive role in your early game experience, and make no mistake, Fear and Hunger 2's early game is where you are far more likely to encounter stress, damage and death compared to the mid to late game, where you're going to be far more confident, well equipped and capable. Furthermore, also understand that not every character is equally effective at everything, and that a few are more beginner friendly than others, whilst others might struggle a bit to begin with and then turn into near unstoppable powerhouses by the mid game, Osa. Speaking of Osa, his introductory backstory is definitely the longest and most unique, with him being a yellow priest hailing from the continent of Abyssonia, which is this world's version of Africa. Of all eight playable characters, Osa is the only one to have actually visited the dungeons of fear and hunger from the first game, where he even encountered a certain fan favourite, disembodied head, the new god Nashra, who, after a series of expletives, convinces Osa to journey far to the war-torn capital of Bohemia, Freehevil, and indeed, just like all the other main characters, he's heading there via train. Difference with Osa's intro though, is that you can literally die on it. It happened to me, via a coin flip no less, and there's going to be plenty more coin flips to come. After your character's history, there's another intro sequence that is also optional, but which you should still do if it's your first or second time playing the game, just to give you a taste of all the nastiness still to come, where your character falls asleep before later waking back up, with all the other passengers still out like a light, and upon moving from carriage to carriage, you exit out into a completely different setting, a strange workshop, only to be immediately assailed by some dude straight out of a nightmare, and worst of all, he's naked. 
I hope this video does not get demonetized. My ability to make a living aside though, this is the kind of stuff that I love, and that I find uniquely terrifying and disturbing. This encounter with the janitor is just so weird and nasty, this bizarre unclothed being coming out of nowhere and threatening and screaming at your character while his eyes bulge out of their sockets, and that design with the skin of his back peeled back, oh my god. As well as being an incredibly talented developer, Miro's enemy designs have to be the most nightmarish I have ever seen in games, rife with details and ideas and subtle connections to other entities and hidden meanings and symbolism, all while being really fucked up. There's a fight with the janitor here which most players will lose, but which you certainly can win and even nab yourself a half decent weapon, though if you do lose, things get even meaner and grislier still when this happens. Better get very used to this sound effect if you're plan planning on playing much Fear and Hunger 2. Nearly all the characters are forced to crawl around after this happens, but a really nice touch is that Olivia is no worse for wear and can continue to use her wheelchair, leading to a hall which might be very familiar to folks who made it far enough into Fear and Hunger 1, with this being the same grand hall housing innumerable new gods from that game. The roster of new gods has grown since then though, and you can even spot familiar characters like Francois and the Tormented One sitting silently along with all the others, though shortly after, just as your chosen character literally begins to lose their mind, they are again transported to a completely different location for an audience with a completely different character, and looming behind him in the night sky, a completely different god. We are now on top of a structure known as the Hollow Tower, and this is where the main plot conceit is introduced by this strange bird-like character named Percola. Again, I apologise if my pronunciation is a bit shit. Even though there are a few of them who you might not see for a while yet, in addition to your chosen character, there were 13 other people aboard that train into Preheval, and now all 14 of you are part of an inescapable festival known as Termina, which Percola says has been put into action as per the will of his master, the trickster Moon, Rare. That's right, in this world, the Moon is a literal god, and an old god too, the most powerful and ultimately unknowable forces in the universe, with the other old gods being Grogoroth, the god of destruction, Sylvian, the god of love and creation, Vanushka, the god of nature, and the god of the depths, the god of loathsome and unwanted creatures. We saw rows upon rows of new gods sitting in the Grand Hall before, but for as strange and powerful as they may be, they pale in comparison to the old gods, who are far more akin to being forces of nature, rather than being distinct entities with comprehensible consciousnesses. But Hercule claims his master is rare, and that the festival of Termina must be enacted, a literal battle royale between all 14 contestants of which there must be only a single survivor after the time limit of 3 days, otherwise bad things will happen, very bad things. After this unsettling lunar encounter, your character wakes back up in the train, and upon regrouping with the other passengers, or as I'll refer to them from here on out, contestants, it's revealed that everyone had the exact same dream. Thus, everyone is now uncomfortably aware of what Termina entails, though some are still very much sceptical. Like Karen, a journalist who originally hailed from Bremen before her family were exiled, who believes that the Bremen army must be behind this somehow, with them being well known for committing atrocities within the countries they've invaded throughout the war. To be honest, no one here is massively alarmed by the contents of the dream, and they certainly don't make any move to enact upon the supposed wishes of Percola and the Moon God just yet, though one of the reasons for that is that they still don't quite believe it. Recall how I mentioned that the world of fear and hunger is far less focused on gods and magic and superstition these days, being more focused on logic, science and technology, and furthermore, other than the dream and the fact that the train isn't moving and no one knows why, none of our contestants have actually seen anything overtly disturbing just yet, but it's early days and at this point we are free to explore, though our ultimate destination is that colossal structure looming over every other building in the town the same hollow tower from the dream. 
It's a brilliant introduction with big intriguing setups and strange eldritch entities, pulling you in regardless of how familiar you already are with this universe, and even delivering a couple of brutal introductory punches to the nuts, just to let you know what sort of game you're dealing with here. You literally get your legs cut off with a bone saw by a naked man with the skin of his back peeled back within the first 10 minutes of the game. Your introduction to the rest of the contestants is also superbly done. I hate to get on my compliment horse again, but as well as Miro being a superb developer, artist and composer, he's a damn good writer of characters too. Like I said, excluding minor NPCs and major antagonists, there are 14 contestants and they all have well written, fleshed out and intriguing personalities with great dialogue. All of them are very much likeable or intentionally dislikable for different reasons and I always got excited when I'd encounter someone out in the world to see what they had to say about the current situation or surrounding environment. Mind you, just like in the first game, if you choose to play as someone, even though they have a character history which you read through and make your choices with at the start, they really do kinda cease to be a character with an actual personality when you are playing as them. Olivia is a lovely, friendly woman who always provides a pleasant interaction when you see her out and about in Preheval, but when you're playing as her, that doesn't really come through at all. In fact, your selected character is largely an avatar with which you make your in-game choices. Or did I just describe literally any game there? But I hope you get what I mean. Or Marco is this taciturn fighter who, despite fighting his whole life to protect himself and his sister and to keep himself on the straight and narrow, still ended up on the wrong side of the wrong sorts of people. And when you encounter him, he's either brooding in a corner, lashing out at awful people or performing lovable acts of gallantry. But when you're playing as him, he's just you and you can either act like a damn sweetheart or choose to completely immerse yourself in this murderous festival of Termina. So now that I've provided the setup for the game's world and plot, let's talk about the actual game part of it, finally. What the hell kind of game is Fear and Hunger 2 anyway? It was made in RPG Maker MV, so is it an RPG? Kinda, yes. Ah. So I get EXP and stuff for winning battles and level up and what have you? Well, no, there actually is no EXP in Fear and Hunger. In fact, instead of seeking out enemies at the beginning to level up your shit and get stronger, you are heavily incentivized to avoid conflict, at least at the start of the game, especially if you're a beginner. The sheer brutality of Termina's combat is certainly communicated to you in that intro sequence with the janitor, but it does not stop there. In fact, this brutality will be repeatedly axed, knifed and hammered home to you again and again and again, but that's just all part of the player's journey from timid beginner where you can't seem to do anything or go anywhere without getting destroyed to confident pro where you're destroying every moon scorched entity in sight. If I had to sum up what Fear and Hunger 2 was in a few words, I would say it's a survival horror RPG with minor roguelike elements. And honestly, for as interesting as that sounds and for appealing as it all seems, it can be very difficult to take in at first. And that's because this game is so damn unconventional, it revels in not following the rules. But let's cover everything element by element, starting with movement and navigation. You move around in Fear and Hunger 2 like you would pretty much any old school RPG, though a nice and frankly much needed improvement from the first game is that instead of only being able to move up, down, left and right, you can move diagonally too, and this also applies to looting crates and barrels and such as well, whereas in Fear and Hunger 1, if you saw something that seemed lootable but it wasn't lying in one of those four directions, you just could not get to it. It's not at all obvious that you can do this here either, and I'm sure there must have been many a player who beat the entire game without even realising this. Another big change with the sequel, and one I sure as fuck missed, was that you can dash by default now. Now, dashing was a thing you could do in the first game as well, but you had to have it as a skill, and indeed, it was arguably the most useful skill in that game, but here you can dash right from the get-go by holding shift whilst moving. Except, I just didn't know this and so simply walked everywhere, like a buffoon. Oh look, a sickle-wielding villager with half his face melted off is stalking me. No bother, I'll just slowly walk away. Funnily enough though, dashing wasn't actually in Fear and Hunger 2 at launch. It was patched in a month and a half after in update 1.8, 
meaning that for as vital as your dash absolutely seems at times, it's completely possible to beat the game without it, even on Maso mode. Not sure if Maso mode is something I'll ever properly attempt myself, but among its many merciless difficulty increases and conditions across the board, if you spend too long walking around outside in the one go, you die, initiated by a chilling message at the bottom of the screen saying the moon god has noticed you, and ending in this. This mode is absolutely brutal even with being able to dash, but Christ knows what it would have been like without it. All 8 playable contestants have very meaningful differences between them, particularly in combat, but the most unique as far as overworld travel is concerned is Olivia, who is confined to a wheelchair, though thankfully she still does have a dash of sorts. Biggest difference with her though is that she can't travel upstairs on her wheelchair, meaning you need to get off it and crawl up, which resulted in several sphincter clenchingly tense moments on my playthrough with her, particularly in central preheval whenever I would have a bobby or two chasing me near a set of stairs, and if you get caught by an enemy without your wheelchair equipped, Olivia will begin the battle lying down where she cannot launch regular attacks, meaning you've got to waste a turn equipping the wheelchair. Even on a wee bit with just one or two steps, got to get off and crawl up, though a nice perk is that she can whiz downstairs super quickly and it's quite fun. Must admit I got pretty damn worried when I reached my first ladder as Olivia, thinking how is this going to work, but thankfully she's a beast and can climb up with just her arms. She's a pull up monster. Her unique mechanics might sound like a bit of a pain in the tits to deal with, but I absolutely love the way Olivia was handled in this game. Compared to everyone else, playing as her feels fundamentally different, requiring you to really think about how best to navigate particular sections of levels that you would simply be able to stroll through with any other character. It's bloody brilliant and it's all worth it too because she can get very strong in combat. Got to highlight one small section that nearly gave me a goddamn anxiety attack though. It's in the preheval outskirts and there's this dead tree stump where you can find a secret stash of shillings and booze, as revealed if you talk to Levi when he's in your party in this area. But I got stuck here for about 8 straight minutes. I just couldn't get out, and the graphical style played a big part in the extent to which the layout absolutely baffled me. See, even though you can run diagonally, that doesn't really apply where actual 2D assets are involved, because they take up certain blocks of space and that's that. And so, even though you might see a big space between a rock and a tree, where you should be able to just squeeze through, and even though it looks like you should be able to pass behind a tree to get out, no, you can't. Seriously, I don't usually get too stressed when playing games, but I got so fucked up trying to make it out of this stupid bloody thicket. For as much as I love the graphical style, there were a few other sections where they did give me issues too, where it was a bit difficult to tell exactly what I was looking at or where to go. For example, I initially thought the department store was very barren. There were a couple of floors and a couple of rooms, but other than a good piece of armour you could pick up on the first floor, there was bugger all here, though you can hear a lot of horrific, tortured screaming coming from above, immediately upon entering. Well, turns out there is another floor further up that you can get to via these stairs. I don't know, maybe I'm a blind fool. <laughs> I found them extremely difficult to spot. In fact, I'm lying. I didn't spot them. I had to look up how to get up here on YouTube. I don't want to make out that this is a huge issue or anything though, because there's really only a few examples of stuff like this. As far as exploration goes, Fear and Hunger 2 is a remarkably free and flexible game, though for me that served to make it all the more intimidating to start with. I mean, the nature of Termina is communicated to you at the beginning, and you're told to make your way to the Hollow Tower, which lies within Preheval proper. And indeed, several characters you come across in the early game will direct you into town, so in light of all that you might think the game gives you ample direction, but the thing is there's a bunch of ways to do a bunch of things. For example, you'll come across the main gate into central preheval early on in Old Town, but it's locked and requires two keys to open it, one of which can be given to you by the gentleman providing you answer his odd questions, whilst the other one can be picked up from a soldier's corpse down in Tunnel 7, just by the teleletroscope, thus allowing you to progress directly into town. But instead of that, you can choose to infiltrate into town via the sewers if you get the key from Henrik. Or, if you started out as Levi and picked the trench gun in his intro, simply shoot the lock. 
Or maybe you got lucky as hell and found the bolt cutters in some box somewhere and now you can just cut through the big lock. Or maybe you found yourself a piece of chalk and read yourself the Vanushka skin bible allowing you to draw its sigil on the ritual circle in the outskirts so as to generate a massive shortcut into the deeper woods from which you can travel north and into Preheval, though take care to watch out for spike bits and booby traps and you know what just watch out for everything okay? And honestly, there's even more ways still to get to where you need to go, some of which are more complicated and esoteric than others. And then once you get into the city, it's even worse, or better depending on how you look at it. The game opens up even more at this point, with a ton of places to go and different objectives that are only relevant to particular endings, and you're picking up key items and statues and portraits and solving puzzles, and entering into screaming nightmare dimensions and dungeons and churches, and it can all be so bloody overwhelming if you don't quite know what you're doing. I'll be completely transparent here and say that I did use the wiki and YouTube and such a bunch on my first playthrough, especially for the combat. And I don't regret it either, because if I did have to go in and stay in completely blind, I'm not sure I'd ever have managed to beat the game at all. That definitely won't be the same for everyone of course, I know some folk relish the hardship and the feeling of being lost and confused in a strange and unfamiliar city and then gradually learning to overcome it, all through their own cunning and gumption. And I'd normally enjoy that too, but not with this bloody game. Not with fear and hunger too, I've suffered with it too much, though as I'll go into in more detail later on in the video, a big reason for a lot of my suffering was due to a profound misunderstanding I had regarding the game's save system. For as intimidating as the LA game can be though with all the different options and routes, I'll also say that Preheval is an incredibly and intricately designed world that feels increasingly satisfying to navigate through the more you learn its layout. Although it's way too easy to miss, you can pick up a Preheval map at the start in the train, and it's a pretty damn decent map too, even letting you know where you are on it, and it also gets updated with a few specific markings related to certain objectives later on in the game. The map's very similar to the ones from the Silent Hill games actually, but I'm hardly the first person to spot the Silent Hill influences in Fear and Hunger 2, am I? I mean, for a start, there's the pervasive fog, and then you have the little girl at the beginning drawing something extremely similar to the seal of Metatron, just like Alessa does repeatedly in Silent Hill 1. Then there's the orphanage level in the northwest corner of the town which is extremely similar to Silent Hill 1's Midwich Elementary School, including the cherub enemies which also resemble the children found in the school. Then you've got the lake where you can row out on a boat into the fog very similarly to where you row out to Lakeview Hotel in Silent Hill 2, and the neighbour enemy looks very similar to the closer enemy from Silent Hill 3. Those are just the Silent Hill references that spring to mind too, but there are others, and there are certainly references to other games too, like the Hunter's Lamp from Bloodborne, Caligura who kinda looks like Marlon Manson, Stitches who kinda looks like Marlon Manson, Needles who looks extremely similar to the clown from the movie Terrifier, Rare who looks very similar to the moon from Majora's Mask. I've never played a Zelda game before but I believe Majora's Mask also has some sort of timer thing going on too doesn't it? And also apparently Marco's design is a reference to something from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, though again I haven't seen it. There's a lot of references to a lot of things and I like it enough. If this was a more bland, less bold game then I might just have found myself rolling my eyes at some stuff like this, but the fact is that Fear and Hunger 2 consistently shocked, disgusted and thus delighted me from start to finish with its story, setting and designs, so chuck all the references in that you like, especially more Bloodborne ones. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, the world design. You've got the outskirts and old town to the south, then the maiden woods and deep woods further west, and then riverside further east, but pretty much everything else, at least on the ground level, is the town of Preheval, divided up into different districts. And honestly, for a 2D game it's surprisingly dizzying when you first get there. The map definitely helps, but even with it navigation is anything but straightforward. It's never a straight jaunt from one place to another. You often have to climb staircases, take shortcuts, enter a building in one district to exit out into another, travel through the sewers etc, and all the while you've got very, very dangerous enemies to try and evade whilst doing it, and let's not forget needles. There have been many times where I found myself saying, how the fuck do I get to the bookshop from here? 
How the hell do I get down to the deep woods from West Preheval? Oh god, I've stepped on a booby trap and I've lost half an hour of progress. Oh fuck, there's the mob and I'm not prepared and now I've lost 45 minutes of progress. Good lord, it's needles and I don't have any murky vials and now I've lost an hour of progress. <sighs> All this oppression and confusion is by design though. I remember seeing some brilliant statement about the Fear and Hunger games. I think it was in a Steam review where the reviewer said something along the lines of, you know that feeling in Dark Souls where you enter into some scary new level that you're clearly under-leveled and under-equipped for? Yeah, every level was like that in Fear and Hunger. When you first make it to Central Preheval and you see these multi-armed bobbies chasing after you and you're getting ominous notifications about creepy laughter and you don't know whether to head west or east or what you're supposed to be doing, it's all by design. It's to make you uncomfortable and disturbed for you to either give up or persevere or look at the wiki like I did. Spatially, there's not only the layouts that you see on the map either. You've got your main overworld map here that you can roam around in, but you also have your larger and more labyrinthine sections that run beneath all this, like the various tunnels and sewer sections, with some parts of these allowing for potentially easier navigation from one part of town to another, while other parts are key for fulfilling certain objectives. Then there's the actual levels within the city, like the Orphanage, the Church of Olmer and the White Mould Apartment, with these being very large in their own right and featuring some of the tightest and most traditional level design in the game, and even the occasional puzzle, like the washing machine one, the solution of which actually differs slightly from one playthrough to another, kinda like Silent Hill 2's save combination puzzle. And speaking of Silent Hill, again, there's another aspect of Fear and Hunger's world that is very reminiscent of it, that being the Rare Dimension, accessible by warping there via a rare sigil drawn on a ritual circle, though in the case of the White Mold Apartments, you get there by crawling through a bloody hole, again, all quite familiar. These sections are where the already overt gore and horror gets up to even greater heights, or should I say murkier depths featuring all sorts of bizarre imagery, increased concentrations of monsters, and in the case of the apartment's rare dimension, the most horrific music track in the game. Remember what I said about the game being out to make you uncomfortable and disturbed? Yeah. Of course, there is a good reason why you'll want to be visiting all these thoroughly nightmarish levels, because after making it into Central Preheval, regardless of which ending you're going for, at some point you will need to make it further north into Monument Alley and the Temple Site, where the museum lies if you're going for ending A, or where the Hollow Tower stands if you're going for ending B or C, and the only way to get to the Temple Site is to collect a Martyr Effigy from beneath the church, the Fellatio Effigy from the Rare Dimension accessible via the aforementioned White Mold Apartments, and the Hunger Effigy from the Trench-like Rare Dimension accessible via the Orphanage. Thankfully, you can pick up a note of the church which marks the locations of all the effigies on your map, and indeed, once you make it to the northern section, as long as you've killed the 13 other contestants, you can head on up to the tower, though if you're going for ending A, you can completely ignore the festival and not kill a single other contestant, and instead focus on activating the three telelectroscopes, the locations of which you can mark on your map as per a map. Fuck. As per a piece of intel you can find in the hidden hideout located in the basement of Preheval Bop, though I'll discuss the endings in more detail towards the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. For now, I think it's high time I discuss the main source of torment in Fear and Hunger 2, the bloody combat. Sure, navigating Preheval might cause stress, strain and confusion, but the combat is where almost all runs get thoroughly ended or near irreversibly tarnished. I remember that first fight with that loathsome janitor and how badly it went and how horrid the aftermath was, but hey, I said, it's like the grafted scion from Elden Ring. Although it's possible to beat, you're pretty much expected to die here in a way that's semi-scripted. I then strayed from the train, heading progressively further to the west and north, seeing some grisly sights along the way, whilst feeling increasingly unnerved by the unsettling music and thick fog, but not yet facing any immediate and direct threats. But then I got to the woodsman's house, and was greeted by this sight. 
This is done in a way where you have plenty of time to run away and you can carry on closer to Prahevel's old town by heading right and up here. But you can also take on the woodsmen, and who could blame you? Unless you choose to go east from the train at the beginning, this is the first enemy you come across outside the dream sequence. How hard could he be? Well, if you're on your own with starting gear with no accessories equipped, with little to no skills learned, with little to no knowledge of how Fear and Hunger 2's combat works, the woodsmen can easily destroy you, not only by depleting all your health, but also by chopping off your limbs, meaning that from this point in the game onwards you literally just can't wield some or any weapon, meaning the run's effectively over. Sure, you could hope you'll find the Sylvian Skin Bible, but why the fuck would you know what that even is at this point, or what it does? The game doesn't tell you. Another thing that can happen in the Woodsman fight is the dreaded coin toss, a fear and hunger staple. That's right, a coin toss. Heads or tails, baby? At many points throughout this game, your fate will literally be decided by a coin toss. Doesn't matter if it's been an hour since you last saved, and it doesn't matter how well equipped you are and how well the run's going. You can just die or take massive damage at the virtual flip of a virtual coin. Of course, in a way the overworld is even worse when it comes to this sort of stuff, because it's also full of run ending or run ruining hazards, even right here in this vicinity. If you choose to jump down into this well after either killing the woodsman or after Tanaka has been killed in some way, game over. If you jump down into Old Town's shit pit, just to the north of here, game over. Stand on a booby trap over in the West Freehevel Ruins, game over. Accidentally walk over a spike pit in the deep woods, game over. Walk into a bear trap over in Old Town. Well that's not a game over, but you're going to have a pretty rough time finishing the game with no legs, aren't you? Eh? Fall off the rafters, in the Church of Almer. Also not a game over, but it may as well be if you break an ankle from the fall and can no longer dash. And game ending moments like these appear a lot in combat too. In fact, sometimes they will even appear at the very start, right before you've even had the chance to make a single fucking move. So what gives? Doesn't that suck? Doesn't it make you seethe with rage and frustration that you can so easily die and have to replay however much of what you've just bloody played through because of some difficult to spot hazard or combat move that you never saw coming? Yes, in fact it fucking sucks and there's been many times when I've been playing this game where I die and lose a ton of progress and feel very annoyed and question why I'm even playing it to begin with if it pisses me off so much. I might even shut the game off and go do something else and stew on it before coming right back a short while later to give it all another go, before eventually something clicks and I figure out where to go, where not to go and how to defeat particular enemies in ways that may not be completely safe but which drastically minimise my chances of sustaining a run ending injury or dying. See, despite being turn based, Fear and Hunger 2's battles really don't play out like those from any sort of traditional RPG. For a start, the battles aren't random at all. You can see every enemy in the game in the overworld first, and as such almost all of them can be completely avoided if you're nimble enough with your movements and manoeuvres, and this is exactly what you're going to want to do in the early game. Even your most basic enemies like the Headless Hounds, the Crazed Moonscorched, and your armed villagers can all destroy you, be it via limb removal, infection or just by dealing a ton of damage. And while there are rewards for beating enemies, you really have to consider how confident you are that you can beat them without your characters getting too badly fucked up in the process. If I'm playing as Osa and I've only just got into town with my starting equipment and no other party members to back me up, I'm far more likely to try and avoid the villagers here because they have a decent chance to deal real harm to me before I can take them down. Same with the woodsmen, but if I've got an ally with me I'll often try taking them on without a second thought because now the odds are substantially more in my favour. The exact same applies to the bobbies which are very common throughout central preheval with these anomalous multi-armed monstrosities being a nightmare if you're fighting them on your own but as they can be fairly comfortably taken down with a character by carefully removing their limbs, which brings us onto the limb system. Enemies having specific body parts which can be targeted is certainly something that's been done before in games, but it is a core feature of Fear and Hunger 2's combat, because if you go in trying to beat enemies by hitting them in any old place, it's not going to go well for you. This isn't that sort of game. 
For as monstrous, mutilated and mutated as most of this game's enemies are, most of them still have two legs, two arms, a torso and a head, though by no means is that an exhaustive list of limbs. Unfortunately, there are other more alarming ones that I can't show you because this is YouTube. Many different enemies require different strategies to defeat them optimally, but the basics are, if you see someone holding a frightful looking weapon, probably a good idea to destroy the arm holding it to completely remove the possibility that they can attack you with it. Now that doesn't mean that just because you've gotten rid of the Crimson Father's dagger or the villager's sickle that they are now defenceless, because many enemies have multiple alternate attacks corresponding to different limbs, which are usually still dangerous but perhaps less likely to result in you losing life or limb. And some enemies carry a weapon in both hands. Good early example of this is the female villager. Enemies like this are a nightmare if you haven't found another party member to allow you to take out both arms before she gets a turn in herself, but then you've got something like the Death Mask, who also wields a powerful weapon in each hand, can easily chop off limbs, and where each arm has a ton of HP, which makes a big difference from most enemies where a limb can usually be destroyed with a single hit. And even once you do destroy all attacking limbs, most foes can still use Tackle, which won't ever inflict any nasty status effects, but which can still pack a surprising punch. Then there's the legs. Destroying just one leg will pretty much never have any real effect, but as long as you're up against something even vaguely anthropomorphic, destroying both legs will usually always put the enemy off balance, allowing for you to target their head for big damage, usually resulting in a kill. Your first instinct might be to try and target the head immediately upon entering any battle, but your first instinct would be erroneous here, because your chances of actually hitting an enemy's head with a basic attack are slim to none. This isn't the case with throwable items though, and it certainly isn't the case with otherworldly magic, which can accurately hit heads right off the bat, but you might not have any magic at your disposal, and you might be saving that special item for some particularly difficult enemy still to come. To aid with all this, you've also got the Rev system, which is new to Fear and Hunger 2, adding a nice bit of extra flavour and tension to how battles play out. You get one Rev point at the end of every turn, up to a maximum of three, as represented by these triangular yellow icons, and they are key for throwing out extravagant degrees of damage, especially if you're going for a melee focused build. Using one ref point means your next attack will pack more of a punch, whilst using two will make it even stronger still, but if you can resist the urge to use your ref points too quickly, using three means you get to attack twice the next turn, which as you'd expect can be huge, and can make it very worthwhile to play a bit more defensively sometimes, because regardless of whether you're using an item to heal, attacking, using magic or guarding, you will always gain another ref point at the end of your turn, and guarding in particular is key to avoiding many of the game's more grievous and egregious instant deaths. You can almost always tell when something is about to throw out a really scary attack too, because a particular body part will often flash, accompanied by some ominous message at the top of the screen. If you just carry on attacking with reckless abandon, hey, maybe you'll strike the finishing blow before that enemy has a chance to let their special attack loose, or maybe you won't, and from there it's all a matter of winning that dreaded coin flip. It's brutal and it feels unfair, but at the same time, there is almost always an opportunity to avoid the coin flip scenario in the first place if you know what to watch out for, which sadly you almost certainly won't if you're a newbie. However, like it or not, a central design focus with the Fear and Hunger games is that you will die. A lot. It's just a reality. But, that every time you die, you will learn a little bit more to help you get that little bit further the next time. Is this a fair process? Well, that's very much debatable, isn't it? Is it a fun process? Well, for me, no. <laughs> for the most part. In fact, I kind of fucking hate it. At least up until the point where I finally get it, at which point I start to have fun again. This game is not for everyone, and that's fine. It really wasn't for me either, to be honest, but through brute force, after about 10 hours of trying, I finally managed to get to the point where I really, really enjoyed it. Though I've still never gotten to that point with the first Fear and Hunger game. In fact, whilst writing this script, I went back to try it again to see if I might have more success and fun with it now that I'm far more experienced with the second game, and no. In fact, it was another relentless sequence of obnoxious deaths, 
and having to restart the fucking run because I made the mistake of getting hit by an enemy and now my limbs are infected so what's even the goddamn point in continuing? Someone reminds me why I'm even playing this game again. I'll get you one day though, fear and hunger one. I'll get you. Back to the combat though, the whole limb system means that there's a lot of room for interesting strategies for beating enemies. By the end game you really can get to the point where you're strong enough to just barrel through bad guys without all that much thought for strategy or finesse, especially if you've got two or three other contestants in your team, but for the most part you're going to want to think things through. Removing the limb holding a particular weapon and then going for the legs, or going straight for the torso after they've been disarmed, works pretty damn well for a lot of stuff, but just try that tactic with the power man, because you can't. Not only is the power man, Powerman? Probably one of my favourite designs for any enemy I've ever seen for any game ever, but I also love the strategy to beat them. First time I saw them running across these church rafters, I shat my pants, and I was correct to do so because they've got a lot of health, and they can pull out the bulldoze attack where if you lose the coin flip you are knocked off the rafters down onto the church floor, where you may well damage your ankle and lose the ability to dash for the rest of the game. At first, they seem impassable, unbeatable, unstoppable, but if you look very closely at their sick abs, one of those sick segments will always be pulsating. It's very subtle and damn difficult to notice if you don't know to look for it, but it's there, and destroying the pulsating segment will end the fight very quickly. Thus, the Pilarman went from being an enemy I was terrified by, to one that I really wasn't intimidated by at all, because now I know the solution to this puzzle. Another example is the Owl Cultists from the Deep Woods. The Deep Woods is a very weird and dangerous area, with it extending into the deeper woods, and then ultimately the deepest woods where Bunker 1 can be found, and the Centaur. Funnily enough, the very first time I made my way through the Deep Woods, I somehow managed it no bother. There are a few spike pits dotted around which you need to look really carefully at the ground to spot, but I didn't know they were there and so I just sprinted through and avoided them through luck. The main enemies here are the Owl Cultists. They can spit poison darts at you from the overworld, but poison is essentially just a non-issue in this game, and so this was not a problem, though even in battle I was able to nail them before they got a chance to do much of anything. Next bunch of times I came through here though were a frustrating ordeal. This time I fell into a damn spike pit and lost a bunch of progress, and so I thought, okay, now I know where the trap is so I will avoid it next time, only to fall into a different spike pit next time, cause turns out there's more than one. But the owl cultists were what really drove me up a goddamn wall or tree, cause unless you've got enough damage output to destroy their arms in turn 1, they will use distraught melody which summons an owl sprite, and owl sprites use one attack and one attack only. Peck. Win the coin flip and you dodge it, unharmed but lose it and it's an instant death. Happened to me several times and I got so pissed off, because it felt like it was literally just luck which determined my chances of survival in this level. Sure, you can run away once the Owl Cultists summon the Owl Sprite, but these enemies are very fast, and when you enter back into a battle with an enemy you ran from in this game, things remain exactly the same as where you left them, meaning you can get picked to oblivion right away. However, and there really is always a however in this game, I then realised that Peck always seemed to target my main character, meaning any companions I had with me were safe from it. So all I had to do was guard with my main guy or gal when the Owl Sprite was summoned and then carry on attacking with my other party members. Easy peasy. Another classic example is Needles. Many players first encounter needles down in Tunnel 7, which can be accessed very early on, and which I'd very much recommend for newer players because you can recruit a Bella into your team here who will make all subsequent combat encounters significantly more doable. Once you progress far enough though, you come across the dreadful sight and sound of a malevolent killer clown sawing someone's head off, with that someone being Tanaka, one of the 14 contestants. If you're quick enough you can actually block needles in here with the crate so that he can't get to you but regardless he will still become a massive thorn, or should I say needle, in your side once you make it into central preheval. The place is already big, confusing and hostile enough even without this whip wielding prick, but every now and then you will hear manic laughter in the distance and get this intimidating message at the bottom, meaning needles is nearby, so beware. 
He will chase you all around town from zone to zone and there was even one time I went into an alley to open a chest and saw him literally peeking around the corner when I came out again and it was terrifying and what makes him so terrifying is that he can be very, very difficult to beat early on. He does a lot of damage, can cause bleed and infection and will frequently throw out the coin flip attack mystery injection. His arms also have a surprising amount of HP but this is the really fun part. If you destroy an arm, say his right one, so that he can't use needle whip anymore, he'll just pull out a gun. But on the other hand, literally, if you choose to destroy his other arm, he will also pull out a gun. I could not believe how difficult Needles was when he first started showing up. I assumed that you must only be able to beat him in the end game and that I would just need to put up with him until then. However, if you happen to have a murky vial on you, free kill. Bit too early for you to have gotten your hands on a murky vial? Okay, got any otherworldly magic? Target the head and it's pretty much a free kill. Not got any magic? Okay, well you're bound to have a bunch of glass shards. Just toss one at his head to massively decrease his accuracy rate. The game is full of shit like this, and despite how difficult enemies may appear at first, there are often multiple effective ways to deal with them, some of which you might not even initially expect, like the talk option. You can talk to enemies in battle, with this often evoking really interesting and unexpected dialogue and information about the enemy in question and the world and story as a whole, but it can also straight up win you the fight. If you choose the correct options with the crazed Moonscorched in Old Town, not only will they stop attacking you, but they'll give you an item for your trouble. Though beware that this does only seem to work on the two Moonscorched in this section, the ones down in the sewers are wise to it. The talk option can also be used to very easily win the fight against Vile near the beginning of the game without you taking a lick of damage, though you do still need to win a coin flip. My favourite aspect of being able to talk to enemies is that, unlike in most horrors or RPGs, a lot of what you fight can still think and talk and even be reasoned with in some cases. Some creatures are completely beyond all hope and understanding and many are at least partially insane. but. You might just be surprised at some of the responses you get from them, or you could just blast them away with a pistol, rifle or trench gun. You might be surprised at just how well that works for a lot of stuff too. Of course, equipment and items are also a major part of combat and this heavily ties into Fear and Hunger 2's roguelike elements. That's not to say that this is a roguelike, because it's not. But just like with the first game, RNG is absolutely a factor, though not quite as much this time round. In Fear and Hunger 1, I believe the actual layout of the game's levels shifted around to some degree from playthrough to playthrough, which is not the case at all in the sequel, but what does change is loot. As I've said, as well as it being an RPG, Fear and Hunger 2 is also a survival horror, and indeed, there are survival elements. In fact, it's in the very name of the game, Fear and Hunger, and the way you suppress your character's fear and cure their hunger is by consuming resources found in crates, briefcases, barrels, shelves and urns, etc. And of course, let's not forget chests. Right from the start, you'll be coming across lootable containers and getting all sorts of stuff from them. Some of which might seem immediately useful, while others might initially confuse you. You might not quite understand why the game is giving you chalk or a bone saw, but oh, you'll soon find out. Much of what you find is food, things like meat pies, mouldy bread, dried meat and all sorts of veg, with these resources obviously being used to keep your hunger meter from getting too low, which causes increasingly deleterious debuffs the closer it gets to 0%, at which point you die. So unless you're chowing down on plates of mushroom stew and meat pies that you found at the bottom of some disgusting barrel down in the sewers, you will go hungry, because the meter is always ticking down except when in battle. Then, on the fear side of things, you also, somewhat less frequently, come across beer, vodka, tobacco and other substances. To be used and abused so as to keep your mind meter from getting too low, which again you do not want to happen, thanks to the brutal panophobia debuff you get permanently afflicted with once it hits zero. Like hunger, your mind is always decreasing, though you can light candles and such to restore 7 points of mind to all party members and I must confess, it took way too long for me to figure that out. 
I was always confused as to why the game was giving me matches, because unlike the dungeons of fear and hunger from the first game, Preheval isn't a dark place at all. Most places are very white and bright, and there's actually not a single place where you need an additional light source, even at night time, but yeah, matches are very useful for a storing mind. A major difference that mind has to hunger though is that it's also used to cast magic, thus it's essentially this game's version of MP, except with a more double-edged nature if you let it run low. Pretty interesting concept really, where you're effectively damaging yourself by using certain skills, though there are ways around this, like equipping the beetle stone accessory which is a guaranteed drop from the female corpse you can cut down from the rafters of the Church of Allmere, which restores some mind after every turn, exactly like the Ring of Wraiths does for health. Accessories aside though, like I said, most resources you find in this game are randomised. However, throughout all four of my runs, I have never once felt remotely in danger of starvation or madness, because the game gives you way too much food and plenty to drink. Regardless of whether I had a party of one or a party of four, I always had an ample supply of food, and if you get your hands on a couple of recipe books, you can even use some of your less nutritious ingredients to create much more filling pies and stews and such. Must admit that my supplies of mind replenishing items did verge on becoming a bit scarce on my more magic focused runs, but even with these, I was never really in any danger of truly running out. This aspect of the game really isn't something I feel terribly negative about, it didn't ruin the experience, but I do feel that if you're going to have survival aspects in your game, unless it's going to have actual resource scarcity, then what's the point? My mind and hunger meters were never something I felt really worried about, they never pressured me into intensifying or accelerating my playstyle. It was more of a case of, oop, a bell is getting hungry, I'll just feed her some mouldy bread and all good. If anyone ever got a hunger debuff, it wasn't because I was low on food, but because I'd just forgotten to give them food, and the lack of scarcity also applied to some other items like white vials, cloth fragments and green herbs. Now, as I've indicated, I'm no pro at Fear and Hunger 1, and I've still never even finished it, but what I do remember is this. Getting infected was one of the most irritating things that could happen to you, and it could happen remarkably easy from the most basic of enemies just a minute or two into the game. Items which cured infections were really scarce, and the only other option was to start sawing off limbs to make an already miserable game even more so, and you had to get rid of infection, otherwise you just died. Can't remember all that much about bleed or poison in Fear and Hunger 1, but I'm sure they sucked too. Well, in Termina, infection, bleed and poison are effectively non-issues. Whenever I got infected or some such by an enemy attack, I just did not give a shit, because I always had more than enough green herbs, cloth fragments and white vials, way more than enough. And just like with food and drink, I guess I think it would have been better if there was more of a middle ground with certain aspects of the game. Some things can so easily and suddenly kill you outright or ruin your run, whereas some others simply don't matter, though I will say possibly the single biggest moment of outrage I had whilst playing Fear and Hunger 2 was when I ended up in a fight with an Inquisitor. I'd never fought one before but I was feeling reasonably confident with my abilities and so said what the hell, let's do it. I used Black Smog which has to be one of the best skills in the game because it hits every target on screen and also causes blindness which is why you really don't want an enemy to use it on you. I managed to finish the Inquisitor off here, only to be greeted by this screen upon returning to the overworld. Cool, I guess I'll just go fuck myself then, run over. Back to the RNG aspect though, the types and amounts of consumables you will find around the world will differ from playthrough to playthrough, but you'll always end up with enough of the basics. Mind you, some items and certainly equipment and books can drastically affect your experience. I never really gave much of a fig about how many rotten meats and beers I find in the early game, but if I get my hands on a salmon snake rune which prevents all limb loss and provides immunity to both bleeds and burns, or a small things amulet which provides a big agility boost to help me towards always being able to act before the enemy and to perhaps even get an extra turn in each round, then that is huge. Exact same as when I get a meat mallet or an officer sword or some such early on, or a pair of light blue vials to allow me to survive the early game long enough to get sufficiently strong. As far as the damage output from your basic attacks, 
Whilst there are ways to raise your base strength, your character's equipped weapon is what determines your damage output, which is why it feels so damn good to find some banger of a weapon early on. Though the greatest weapon in the game is considered to be the meat grinder which deals big damage and hits the enemy three times. I've never actually gotten one myself because you need to craft it with some specific parts as well as having unlocked a Bella's crafting skill but you can see it in action in the mob encounter where a half cocoon uses it to you to great and terrible effect. However, most equipment is primarily found in chests which involve yet more coin flips. If you win, you get an item or a piece of equipment, but if you lose, you get fuck all. Of course, and it really stings when this happens. It feels like such a slap across the face, especially if you use up a lucky coin to increase your chances to 75 and still get nothing. Even if you win though, sometimes it'll be a sickle, and then later on you'll get another sickle, and then later on again you'll find another sickle, but then on other runs, you might just come across one of the best accessories in the entire game in your very first chest that will go on to positively influence the rest of your run. On my first proper run as Marco, I ended up with two salmon snake runes, about four arm guards, and a partridge in a pear tree, and my first hour and a half of play. But then on my subsequent run with Osa, I only found a single limb loss prevention accessory in my entire six and some odd hours of playtime. And that shit changes the way you play, though there are other randomised items too, like books. Just as you find resources in containers and equipment in chests, you find books in bookcases which can be found in various places throughout the game world, though the Mayor's Mansion in Old Town and the Orphanage in the northwest of Prehevil are particularly excellent for finding books, which is again all RNG based. You could get lucky as hell very early on, or you could have rotten luck. Lore books are nice on your first playthrough or two, because they're extremely interesting and allow you to learn more about the world and its history, but they also have absolutely no practical use beyond being enjoyable and insightful to flick through, same with things like the combat manual, the book of fears and anathomia. Basically, when you interact with a bookcase, the worst case scenario is you get a lore or information type book, but then you have the alchemilia volumes which allow you to craft potent heals, cures and explosives out of herbs and oil, the recipes of the 15th century volumes which let you make pies and stews out of your vegetables and mushrooms, and then there is the skin bibles, flesh bound tomes which allow your character to draw sigils corresponding to the different gods. Now some aspects of Fear and Hunger 2 are reasonably easy to understand at first, like equipment and mind and hunger and such, and even the basics of combat, as punishing as they may be, but the whole gods aspect can be a bit more difficult to grasp because it's just not the kind of thing you really see in other games, which in my book just makes it more interesting, at least once I got to grips with what it all meant and how to make use of the power of the gods. At various points around Preheval you will encounter ritual circles, of which there are three different types. The first type is the asymmetric circle, representing the old gods, those being Grogoroth, Selvian, Venushka, the god of the depths and Rare. The second type is the imperfect circle, representing the new gods, of which there are very, very many. Every entity we saw back in the Grand Hall in the intro was a new god, though the one that matters most for gameplay purposes in Fear and Hunger 2 is the Tainted One, and then there's also the Radiating One, who I find kinda lame to be honest, but who acts as a merchant of sorts, and there's also the Heartless One, who is a secret boss who can be fought in the church. The third and final ritual circle type is called the Perfection Circle and is for the Ascended Gods, those being Almer who is essentially this universe's version of Jesus Christ, and there's the God of Fear and Hunger who ascended in the first game's conclusion. All these weird and wonderful deities aren't just aspects of the lore though, but rather they also play a key part in how you play the game and a big part in how you choose to develop your character. Like I said before, while this is an RPG, you don't level up, and as such, a lot of your improvements and base damage potential are going to come from finding better weapons, and from adding people to your party, be they ghoul, goat, or fellow contestant. But just because you can't level up your shit, in the traditional sense, doesn't mean you can't turn your chosen character into an absolute powerhouse, which brings us on to the Hexen, the main incentive for actually bothering to take down regular enemies, also tying into the ritual circles and the very festival of Termina. 
Way back when I was discussing that ghastly intro sequence with the janitor where he saws your legs off to stop you from running off, I mentioned that you had better get used to that sawing sound, and indeed for nearly every enemy you kill, you're going to want to cut off their heads with a bone saw. Bone saws can be found lying on the ground in a few key locations, but you can also find them in containers and they're not terribly rare, though they do have a 3% chance to break each time you use them, and a guaranteed chance to break if you try and use them on particular enemies like the aforementioned Power Man. Furthermore, several enemies don't have cut offable heads at all, which is a touch I really like. Miro could have just made it so that you always get the same consistent reward across the board, but instead he actually thought about it and made it more logical based on the forms of what you're fighting. So if you think you're going to be able to get ahead after killing a headless hound, think again, bucko. And the less said about the Kalagura monster, the better. There are some locations which are great for harvesting heads though, like in the heavily moon scorched section of Old Town where most of the villagers will simply let you kill them. In fact, some of them even beg for you to end their lives and it's all extremely disturbing. You fight all sorts of inhuman monsters in Fear and Hunger too, but the villagers might be the most upsetting to me. The detail and colour of their facial wounds and mutilated eyes is sickening, but you can get a bunch of heads here super easily with pretty much no risk, and the orphanage is another place where it's super easy to get a ton. The cherub enemies aren't terribly difficult to fight, though they can certainly cause some harm if there's two or three of them at once, but if you've got a luger pistol with a bunch of spare ammo, a single shot to them in the overworld is enough to take each one down, and it makes the orphanage kind of a joke. A very depressing joke. Seriously, there's some fucked up shit going on here. With these heads, you can make an offering to the Tainted One at an imperfect ritual circle, with each head getting you a soul stone shard, three of which can be crafted into a soul stone, allowing you to make shit happen on the Hexen. When you rest at a bed, you visit Perkola, who will give you an update on how the festival is proceeding, also letting you know who is alive and who is dead, regardless of whether it was you who killed them or someone slash something else. And you can also save, but as well as this you can visit the Hexen, though in Father Donovan's house in the temple site there's a special table which lets you access the Hexen without having to rest. Each character has a designated skill tree to be progressed along so as to unlock more skills based on that character's history and speciality. So for example, Olivia is a botanist and can learn skills like advanced botanism, allowing her to craft particularly potent herb mixtures, and toxicology, allowing her to craft powerful poisons. Or, Marco is a specialist in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and so is things like Bob and Weave, giving him a great evasion buff for 5 turns, and then Counter Stance, enabling him to counter enemy attacks when hit. There are loads of skills, some of which are only usable in the overworld, some of which are passive, some which can be used at will in battle, some which require one or more rev points to use, and some which open up extra dialogue like Mind Read, Mastery over Vermin, or Diagnosis. Some skills are borderline useless or blatantly self-destructive like Inverse Crown of Thorns, while some others are insanely effective like Spice Forge, Black Smog, Mischief of Rats, etc. The different skills each character starts with or can unlock through their trees really can lead to profoundly different routes and playstyles too. For example, Karen can easily unlock most doors with lockpicking, whereas other contestants need to find small keys, which you might find a bunch of, or you might find absolutely none of even two hours into the game, like has happened with me, all down to RNG. Or Abella has the ability to short circuit electronic locks to pass through doors down in the tunnels that the other contestants cannot access, so you can still retain this ability if you recruit Abella into your party. But you are by no means restricted to just your own skill tree, that would be cruel as hell dangling this huge range of abilities in front of you and not letting you use them, and indeed if you raise your affinity with certain gods, their associated abilities will be available for unlocking on the Hexen. There are some specific ways to gain affinity for certain gods, like if you use the confessional booth in the church, which raises your affinity with Almer. But the simplest way is to carve your chosen god's sigil into the correct corresponding ritual circle. Very important to get that part right too, because if you say carve Venusia's sigil onto a perfect circle instead of an asymmetric circle, not only will you get absolutely zero benefit, but you will explode on the spot.
Nah, not really, but you will lose the use of that ritual circle for the rest of your playthrough, ruining your chance of gaining more valuable affinity so as to unlock even more dangerous and exotic skills, and you can get some really good shit here too. As far as magic goes, Grogoroth's skill tree is the tits, featuring Black Orb and Blood Golem, etc. Whereas Sylvian's skill tree straight up lets you access powerful healing spells, and indeed, the nature of these gods, both ascended and old, dictates the nature of their associated skills. One of the coolest moments I've had when playing Fear and Hunger 2 was when I raised my rare affinity up to max, allowing me to get the Golden Gate skill, facilitating quick travel through the world via interdimensional Golden Gates that are otherwise closed unless you've purchased the skill, and upon trying them out, I realised that you can straight up skip the entire orphanage level by entering straight into the rare dimension and just grabbing the hunter effigy, then heading back out through the golden gate. Or you can play through the orphanage and skip the white mold apartments, depending on which level you like the most or dislike the least. You can get sickeningly powerful in this game too, because there's a severe lack of balance with all this, which seems to be a part of the core design style of Fear and Hunger 2. I mean, this game is unapologetic in its willingness to completely nuke your run at the drop of a hat in the way that most games aren't, and for good reason. Dying sucks, having to replay a level sucks, having to start all over again sucks, and it sucks here too, because nearly everything is lethally dangerous, and even though there might be consistent or at least semi-consistent strategies to deal with most hazards and threats, the chances of you being aware of the optimal strategy on your first attempt at fighting anything is very low and so you're going to get wrecked a lot. But on the other hand, you can also completely turn the tables on the game and get disgustingly powerful yourself if you're making smart use of the hexen. Turn around is fair play, I always say. On my first playthrough as Marco, I got reasonably strong, but nothing crazy, though towards the end game I did have a generous supply of powerful items like murky vials and pep pills, and also plenty of light blue vials to heal myself up. And I had a bell in my party from start to finish after first recruiting her at the entrance to Tunnel 7 in the Maiden Woods. On my second playthrough though, I picked Osa, and holy shit was the difficulty curve a drastic one, and I don't mean it curved up, I mean it curved down. I really didn't feel all that strong at first, because even though Osa starts out with the hurting spell, it still requires a ref point to use, meaning you can't just end a fight quickly by attacking an enemy's head in the first round, and so I had a few dicey situations early on, especially because instead of recruiting Abella at the start, I saved Henrik at the Mayor's Mansion, which makes Abella disappear for the rest of your run, though she does kinda come back. Once I got going with Osa though, heavens to Betsy! Fear and Hunger 2 became nearly trivial. Skills like Spice Forge, Black Orb, Black Smog, La Dance Macabre, Blood Golem, etc. just made most combat a non-issue, not to mention New Game Plus attacks like Moth Swarm and Red Arc if you choose to use them, which I did, because they are there to be used. To say I became overpowered would be an understatement. If you combine Black Smog with the White Spice in Spice Forge, you can win about half the fights in the game without even having to make a move in battle, the, the enemy just dies at the very start. Then for my next playthrough with Olivia, even though I didn't go for any fancy magic for her to learn, throughout the festival I recruited Osa, Abella and Marco into my team, and a team of four contestants can take down pretty much anything. A party of two is plenty, and you can certainly beat any enemy in the game solo, but four is just overkill. Nonetheless, you can do it, and there's really no reason not to. Yes, it means you've got more mouths to feed and minds to maintain, but like I said, food supply just isn't an issue in Fear and Hunger 2. That may not have been the case in the first Fear and Hunger, but it's certainly the case here. And then on my playthrough as Marina, I pretty much became just as powerful as I had in my Osa run, and made use of a ghoul in the early game to serve as a minor source of damage output and a decent meat shield to draw damage away from Marina. One of the reasons I managed to get as powerful as Osa though was because of another great feature of Fear and Hunger 2, which allows you to learn other contestants' skills by collecting their souls. We've been talking about all the exploration and combat and resource management and what have you for a while now, but not all that much about the thrust of Fear and, Hung <laughs> of Fear and Hunger 2 that I outlined near the start of the video, that being Termina, the big battle royale. See, the game does tell you the aim of the festival at the beginning, and then encourages you to make it into town so as to reach the Hollow Tower, standing tall above it all, but then it pretty much leaves it up to you. 
Do you want to start killing these other contestants? It's something you really need to think about because a bunch of them are really likeable and interesting. Tanaka is a damn sweetheart, but here he is off from the train, alone and vulnerable. And look here, August just saved us from a maddened half cocoon charging at us with a meat mallet. That was awesome, thank you August. But again, here he is on his lonesome for us to cross off our list. And bear in mind that there is a 3 day time limit. Another important factor is that each playable character can also be recruited into your party through some means. Some are very easy to recruit and can join up with you on the morning of day one, like Abella, and you can even hook up with Levi and Osa if you know where to find them. And honestly, having even one additional party member is a huge deal, but at the same time, maybe it's easier to just take care of them there and then. There are also special events that will occur between the other contestants at specific times of day or night where they'll get into fights themselves which you can choose to intervene in to stop the carnage or just stand back and let it happen. I took full advantage of this when I was going for ending C where you have to kill all the contestants before day 3 rolls around when I came across Pav having an altercation with Marco and Tanaka. Pav is a really cool character, but he's also an absolute bastard, whereas I really like Marco and Tanaka, but they had to die one way or another, so I just stood back and did nothing while Pav shot them both to death in front of me, after which I nailed Pav with no issues at all. The contestants are almost all extremely easy to beat too, having very low health. Osa can really mess you up if you fanny around too much with him, but in general, they really do make for some of the easiest encounters in the game. And furthermore, you are incentivized to take them out, because like I said, this gets you their soul, allowing you to access their skill tree in the Hexen. Thus, just because you're playing as Abella doesn't mean you can't learn Marco's fast stance or Karen's diplomacy, just gotta kill them first, taking you one step closer to being the last one left standing in the Battle Royale. Of course, you're not gonna see them all right off the bat. Some contestants won't be present in the game world at the beginning, or if they are, they're effectively off limits. See, you might think you can just go on a mad rampage straight after getting off the train, but if you kill a contestant in sight of another, you will get restrained and bound by the others, only being able to get free on the night of day 3, where things are going to be much harder for you and darker. I think now is where I should finally confess to a massive, massive misunderstanding I had about Fear and Hunger 2 which lasted for nearly my entire first playthrough and it pertains to the 3 day time limit. So for many hours I genuinely thought that you only had 2 guaranteed opportunities to save with those being resting on a bed like the one in the train, the mayor's mansion, preheval bop etc. There are other methods of saving of course, but they're not guaranteed and are RNG based. I mentioned the skin bibles earlier, which teach you the various sigils which can be carved into ritual circles to raise your affinity, but these circles also have other uses, like Sylvians which fully restores all your HP and missing limbs, and Venushkas which causes these weird white trees to sprout up from the ground for a shortcut or maybe access to a hidden area but carving the god of fear and hunger sigil into a perfection circle allows you a single save per circle, which is huge because there are a decent enough number of perfection circles throughout the game, and there are also especially useful one time use books of enlightenment which let you save anywhere. The issue though is that you can easily go nearly a whole playthrough without finding the god of fear and hunger skin bible or a book of enlightenment. You might find one within the first 10 minutes of the game or you might be 5 hours in and still haven't found one. Both scenarios have happened to me. Yes, you can buy them from Pocket Cat in the museum, but that's a late game level. But I thought, you start on day 1, and then if you sleep, allowing you to save and access the Hexen, you wake up on day 2. After that, just one more sleep and save and you're on to day 3, and then obviously no more sleeps because that's the last day. Folks, that is not how it works, and I cannot tell you just how much undue frustration and dismay I felt towards Fear and Hunger 2 due to this misunderstanding, because it meant that most of the time when I would experience some bullshit death, it meant I would lose at least half an hour's progress, often more, because I thought I had to be super conservative with my saves to the point of absurdity. The Deep Woods was a really sore level for me for this, because the feeling of falling into a spike pit or getting my main character's fucking head pecked off. 
or getting absolutely obliterated in one turn by the centaur after already risking life and limb to get here because I didn't think I could afford any extra saves beforehand was awful. The worst was at the beginning of the game. I had to replay the early game sections so many times after coming undone in some way in Old Town or Preheval outskirts or by a bobby or needles in central Preheval because I thought I'm still pretty much at the start of the game and I can't afford to use up a valuable save yet. But no, in actuality you're not restricted to just sleeping twice but rather 8 times which is far more fair I think we can all agree. Did anyone else make this mistake? Anyone? It's a good idea to sleep too because it opens up events and interactions with the other contestants that won't happen if you just forever wander around on day one morning. And even on my fourth playthrough, I was still seeing new events that I'd never come across before by making different choices and visiting places at different times of day. And Fear and Hunger 2 really is a game to be replayed multiple times too. It's impossible to see everything on your first run, because you're not supposed to see everything. And also the RNG elements really boost its replayability. It's always great fun starting out and seeing what stuff you find in those early containers and chests and in the library of the mayor's house and such. As well as the different interactions between the contestants and yourself though, there are other special events that will occur if you go for too long without either killing or recruiting particular characters and that event is moon scorching. So about half of the things you fight in Fear and Hunger 2 have been moon scorched, with this being a sort of cancerous transformation of sorts, which is caused by exposure to the old god Rare, either for refusing to take part in one of the previous Termina festivals, from going mad, or from taking too long to dispatch other contestants. The nature of this transformation varies massively of course, with some humans still partially retaining their reasoning skills and even ability to speak, while others have morphed into full blown inhuman monsters. The moon scorched villagers are the most basic type, being found all throughout Old Town, some of which have been driven fully insane by the pain and damage done to their bodies by rare, whilst others still exhibit at least some degree of rational behaviour. You can even find villagers sitting down in a kitchen in one house, and for as violent as he is in battle, Vile can initially be found hanging up some fish. These are the more normal ones too, but there's nothing normal about entities like the Bobbies, stalking around Preheval who sport an extra arm, with their heads and mouths constantly violently twisting and shifting back and forth, or the hilariously named Bellends, guarding Mausoleum Alley and the temple site, or the loathsome neighbours crawling around on all fours down in the sewers and other places. Not all enemy forms are the result of moon scorching though, or at least that's not the sole reason for their new forms. The soul jobs, centaur and living flesh are victims of stitches who, as we see down in tunnel 1, is very true to her name. And in the white bunker, you come across the platoon, who is the result of a Sylvian marriage ritual between a large group of Bremen soldiers, fusing them all into one horrifying being, very similarly to the human hydra from the first game. Speaking of the first game, you also fight Moonless again in Fear and Hunger 2, except he's way bigger now. Definitely one of the best fights in the game too, the way the tension builds up as you see him loom closer and closer to you before the battle properly begins. And good god his theme is so sick, this might be my favourite fight in the game. Those are the regular enemies though, and bosses, but in addition to those the contestants themselves can become moon scorched and these fights make for some of the best in the game, with some of the most interesting, disturbing and fascinating designs. It's not like you need to wait until very late for folk to start becoming moon scorched either. Some of them can transform long before day 3 even rolls around, though if you're playing on Maso mode which starts you on day 3 night, every contestant has already become moon scorched. The trigger for the contestants moon scorching, narratively speaking, seems to be them losing their minds or giving in to the influence of Rare or some other god, hence why they moon scorch prematurely, though you can prevent this from happening in some cases. For example, if you go over to the mayor's mansion on day one morning, you can find Hendrik acting very strangely up on the first floor. It's literally right at the very beginning of the festival, but he's already losing it. And indeed, if you leave him like this or recruit Abella over near Tunnel 7, in which case Hendrik won't appear here in human form at all, by day one evening there is no more Hendrik, because he is transformed into the gentleman. It's not at all obvious that this is Hendrik either because he doesn't acknowledge his former self at all, but 
Yes, it is him. He's a real outlier too because the gentleman is by far the most sane and polite of all Moonscorch's contestants and won't even attack you unless you really piss him off. In fact, he will even help you by giving you the lion brass key for the main gate into town. If you find the food storage room though and then tell Hendrik about it in the morning, he'll calm way down and even cook you food back at the train and then won't Moonscorch until day 3 evening. Another example is Samari. If you manage to get to the Church of Allmer on day 1 morning and make it into the rare dimension in the basement, which is quite difficult by the way, the Crimson Fathers are no joke in the early game, then you can convince her to return back to the train. But come just a bit later or make the wrong dialogue choices and she moonscorches into Dysmorphia, who will fuck you up in the early game. Not every Moonscorch contestant is equally as powerful though and some are far more monstrous than others, with their forms being derived from their deepest, darkest feelings about themselves. There's a book you can pick up which states that moonlight exposes people's true selves, not sunlight. When we're out and about during the day, at work or with friends, we act the way we're supposed to act because everyone can see us, we are vulnerable and exposed and so we need to fit in by necessity, but at night, under the cover of moonlight, we are free to be who we really are. Now, this doesn't quite fit with the different forms of the Moonscorch contestants because rather than them turning into what they really are, it seems to transform them into what they think or fear they might really be deep inside. Thus, Marco transforms into a giant, brutish beast, this thuggish hulk who can easily break your bones and take you out, playing on his fear of becoming a thug, despite his efforts to remain a good person. And Olivia turns into the mechanical dance, this steaming metallic machine with no real degree of flexibility or expression, which can only float in any given direction, trapped inside this iron prison, playing on how she fears people might see her due to her disability. Some of these forms are terrifying and some are very sad, like how you can find the Weeping Scope, the moonscorched version of Levi, roaming around in the orphanage. Levi grew up in this orphanage and was almost certainly abused by the priests here before being sent off to fight as a child soldier in wars. Thus, the Weeping Scope is a reflection of his darkest thoughts about himself as an emotionally damaged killer, with his 303 Mark I rifle being permanently fused to his face. Some of these beings you can communicate with, while others are so far gone that they no longer even have mouths anymore, yet they must scream. Dan's is definitely the most unique though, with him transforming into Pocket Cat, that infinitely elegant yet deeply depraved half-feline fiend who also appeared in the first game, and he is just as evil and fucked up in Fear and Hunger 2, where his pockets remain very, very deep. If you wait until day 3 though and don't have Dan in your party, he moonscorches into Pocket Cat, the new Pocket Cat. His battle art even changes if you look at the pattern of his trousers before and after. Thus, it's really in your best interest to take out contestants before this happens, if you're wanting to take part in the festival. There's no special reward for beating them in their moonscorched forms. You do still get their soul, but for some you can no longer cut off their heads, which you want to be able to trade with Pocket Cat who lets you purchase books of enlightenment or specific skin bibles. All this talk of slaughtering other contestants brings up an important question though, and that question is, do you have to take part in the festival? And the answer to that is no. So there are three endings in Fear and Hunger 2, but only two of them actually require you to engage with the festival. If you're going for ending A, you can completely ignore it, and even do your best to save as many people as possible if you really want, though it's impossible to save absolutely everyone. A very important detail about the Second Great War is that the Bremen Empire suddenly decided they wanted peace very soon after capturing the town of Preheval, and there's a very good reason for this. It's because the Eastern Union had been working on the Logic Project, with the Logic intended to be a core where all the world's knowledge will come from and go to, essentially a new type of god, but not an old god, a new god or an ascended god, but rather a machine god, connected to every person on the planet via its three teleletroscopes. You can find these teleletroscopes throughout Preheval, one in Tunnel 1 located in the deepest woods, one in Tunnel 7 located in the Maiden Woods, and one in Tunnel 4 located in the Foundations of Decay. 
These devices extend out into the world, extracting and exchanging information, or perhaps meant to extract people's literal souls so as to create a shared digital consciousness shaped by every person towards creating the perfect reality, born from a man-made god to rival or perhaps even overshadow the primal powers of the old gods. Like I said though, the Bremen Empire has a particular interest in logic, and indeed, the leader of the Empire, the Kaiser, always clad in his yellow robes, is here in person. Even though I've sure as shit never managed to save him in the first game, the Kaiser is of course Lagarde, whose efforts towards godly ascension were thwarted by the creation of the god of fear and hunger, but he's still alive here in the 20th century, with hopes to influence the creation of this new machine god, who is again born from an actual human. After activating all three teleletroscopes, you can access the White Bunker, which lies directly beneath the museum, though it is guarded by quite a few Bremen elite troopers, who can easily wipe you out if you encounter them early on in the game, but which shouldn't really pose much of an issue by the end game, where you should be strong enough to beat most anything. There's also the Platoon and Sylvian Trooper boss fight, which I've always found to be so goddamn sick. I remember seeing the design of the platoon on a YouTube thumbnail before I even got into Fear and Hunger 2 and was always blown away by it, and the presence of the bizarrely clad Sylvian trooper encouraging it on to greater endeavour with her whip elevates it even more. It's weird, it's fucked up, it's awesome. Really scary too. I haven't really spoke about it too much, but Fear and Hunger 2 is a genuinely scary and unnerving game. It takes a lot for a game to properly get to me, and most horror games I play fail miserably at this, but Fear and Hunger 2 sure as shit nailed it. Parts like in the deepest woods, where the centaur is roaming around, frazzled my nerves, same with the first time I came across the irrational obelisk in the clothes store, and then there's the white mould apartment's nightmare dimension, which is just horrific in every regard. I also found the way Samari transforms into dysmorphia to be seriously disturbing. The sound effect in particular, the way it repeats to sound more low pitched and monstrous each time fucks me right up, only for her to transform into this thing. But yes, the platoon encounter did the same. Just look at this. God damn, that's good shit. I love it so much. After the fight, you carry on to meet the Kaiser, who waits just outside before the logic chamber, soon to be activated, resulting in a boss fight. Other characters can actually try to kill the Kaiser themselves, like Pav, who tried to kill him for revenge just outside the hollow tower, but the bullets have no effect, and Pav gets mortally wounded. And you can also see August attack Kaiser here, if he's still kicking, who also gets killed by him, though I never personally saw this, because I always ended up killing August beforehand. My bad, dude. He can be a pretty tricky boss, but again nothing crazy, though if you destroy his sword wielding arm, he'll start throwing out Black Orb which does massive damage, so it's a decent idea to just leave it up, providing you have limb loss prevention. The Kaiser's design is really cool, especially with his snake coiled around his shoulders, but the most interesting part for me is the literal asterisk floating next to him which itself throws out attacks. Not sure what this is or why it's there, but it's a very cool touch. Yet again though, the Kaiser is defeated before being able to carry out his plans, though a noteworthy detail is how he melts down into the ground here, indicating that this might just be some sort of avatar of the real Lagarde. Maybe he'll turn up again in Fear and Hunger 3, as will Pocket Cat and Moonless, I'm sure. Ahead of Kaiser lies Logic, serving as the game's final fight, though if you don't manage to kill it within 13 turns, its form changes to resemble something far more grotesque and frightening, featuring two hands of destiny which throw out magic and healing. The second phase can be really tough too, so good idea to take it down before it gets a chance to transform, if you can. 
a massively effective tactic for most big HP pool enemies in this game is to apply damage over time, from strong poisons or burning, and murky vials in particular are crazy effective here, hitting all 6 of Logic's tanks, preventing its exhaust system from running at full force, after which it will hit the entire party with overheat, dealing massive damage which is difficult as hell to recover from, especially when it's also throwing out red arc. Just like the boss fights against the more deific type entities from the first game though, even if you beat Logic, it's not really defeated. Rather, the core opens up and your party enters through it in some sense, resulting in a profoundly beautiful ending with an equally beautiful soundtrack, whereupon your consciousness becomes one with every other consciousness within the Logic system. This is especially a good ending to do with Olivia too, because the person at the centre of logic, the one who will to some degree direct it in the future to come, is a girl called Rayla, Olivia's sister. In fact, this is the same girl you see in the workshop in the intro, and she'll also appear as a sort of phantom in places around Preheval, directing you towards the teleletroscopes, or information regarding their whereabouts, with blue moths being an indicator of her influence, the same ones fluttering around here just before the core opens up to expose Rayla's now machine-like form. It's a great ending and I think quite powerful, especially when compared to all the decay and horror found everywhere else in this world, and it's pretty much certain to also be the canon ending. Fear and Hunger 3 has been confirmed to be a thing that will happen, and it makes me excited and curious as hell to think of what sort of setting it will all take place in. Think of the sorts of designs and ideas that could be explored in a more futuristic type Fear and Hunger setting, with more advanced technology. Achieving ending A also seems to somehow put some sort of stop to the festival too, because any characters you didn't kill and who did not moonscorch make it out of preheval alive and no more is said about Pertile, Rare and Termina. It does seem a wee bit clumsy the way the two scenarios play out so separately to one another, and I'm still not quite sure what connection Termina really has to the Logic project, if any. Speaking of the festival though, that brings us to endings B and C. If you're going for either of these, you can 100% ignore all the logic stuff and just focus on killing contestants before the three days are up, after which all you need to do is approach the hollow tower and touch it. If you touch the tower whilst another contestant is still in your party, you can forcibly moonscorch them there and then for a fight right by the tower, and when you're the last one standing, all that's left is to enter and ascend for an audience with Percola and Rare. Here, Percola will congratulate you for winning the festival, though also confesses that Termina is based on a lie, because the trickster moon, Rare, left the world long, long ago. The four-eyed rock looming in the sky above Preheval is a mere trace of the old god, just as you encounter the traces of Grogoroth and of Sylvian in Fear and Hunger 1, because old gods can never really die in the Fear and Hunger universe, the same way a concept or idea can't die. Percolid doesn't name the true architect of Termina in Ending B, but states that the festival's current purpose is to bolster the ranks of his true master. Though due to us taking as long as we did to wipe out every other contestant, we are not worthy of joining those ranks. Thus, our only prize for victory is freedom, but to get that, Percolid first must be defeated. 
He can make for a more difficult fight than Logic too because by definition you can't come into the fight with any other contestants, though there are ways around this. If you recruited Black Caleb into your ranks back in the Woodsman's house, he can join the battle, same with if you've necromancied up a ghoul, and Blood Golems especially are crazy useful here, having double the amount of HP of a regular character, and they only require 2 Grogroth affinity to unlock as well. Again, damage over time like burn and poison are insanely effective here. He's got very powerful attacks like Lunar Meteorite, which you can actually learn yourself in New Game Plus, same as how you can get Red Arc from Logic after beating Ending A, though the first time I fought him, I died from my own attack. After a couple of turns he'll use Wingard, which has the chance to reflect back otherworldly spells like Black Orb and Hurting, punishing you for using these attacks that you might have gotten a bit too comfy using up until now, though his left arm can always be destroyed to disable Wingard. After defeating Percolate, you might assume that you've won and now you get to go home, but this is fear and hunger and so you'd be wrong, wouldn't you? Because the rare rock makes a timely arrival into Preheval for the true final boss. Very surreal fight with very trippy visuals and music. Rare's form is even partially distorted, as if even the traces of it are too much for the human mind to handle, and indeed that is a recurring theme with these games, of human minds bending and breaking due to seeing or even being in the vicinity of these vast unknowable forces of nature. Like some vast lunar angel, Rare has two sets of rotating wheels around him, lined with eyes that drain your party member's mind, though Rare itself will blast you with Moonscorch for massive single target damage, and where Percola threw out Lunar Meteorite, the Moon God uses Lunar Storm which hits the entire party. As ever though, there's no actual defeating one of these entities, and so rather than the battle ending with Rare's defeat, it merely leaves Preheval after growing disinterested in you, leaving you as a frothing, twitching, half-maddened mess on the roof of the Hollow Tower, having witnessed something that no human was ever supposed to witness. Even so, your character does win the festival here and gets to leave Preheval alive, the only one who gets to leave, getting you a different ending depending on which character you picked. However, there is also Ending C, and you can only get this one if you manage to beat every contestant before the end of Day 2, proving that you are bloodthirsty enough to be deemed worthy of joining the ranks of Percola's true master. It's really not all that difficult to do either, to be honest. In fact, I nearly managed to do it by Day 2 morning, but as usual, Kawagura was being a colossal pain in the arse, or should I say balls and so I had to wait until day to night for him to moonscorch down in the sewers. This time, upon meeting Percola, he is even more complimentary than before, revealing that his true master is the Sulphur God. You can see the Sulphur God's sigil in certain places throughout the game, like on the clock in the museum, and the madman's room in white mould apartments. You can also find Dan here, where he recognises the sigil, though unless you're playing as Osa, your own character won't be aware that it is the Sulphur Gods, or even that there is such a thing as the Sulphur God. I'm not going to pretend to be any sort of true expert at Fear and Hunger 2's lore though, and so I would highly recommend folk go and check out Mouth Doog's fantastic video on this subject if you want a proper educated deep dive. I've learned a lot of what I know about Fear and Hunger from watching his fantastic videos and streams. Speaking of the Sulphur Cult though, two members who are implied to be among its ranks are Needles and Stitches, both of whom used to be regular humans, with Needles having been Dan's father-in-law, while Stitches was his wife, though of course by the time we see them roaming around Preheval, it's clear that their former humanity and identities are completely gone, having been replaced with pure brutality, cruelty and bloodlust. Percolet explains how much he and his cult detest the way of things on the planet of humans and their new gods who are essentially just more powerful humans with all the same flaws and base desires. He points out the senseless mass death and destruction caused by the two great wars and explains that the Sulphur cult have rejected this in favour of chaos, a chaos that you have proven yourself to be one with by your actions over the past two days quickly and eagerly taking out scores of Moonscorched and your fellow contestants. Thus, Percola gives you the option to join this Sulphur Cult, though you can still reject him and go for Ending B here. 
If you accept, however, you still need to face off against Perkele, who intends to kill you to complete the death ritual, and for your soul to descend down into the infernal sulphur pits where his deity awaits, for you to be boiled, frozen and then ultimately transformed into something else, just as needles and stitches may have been. Even when you defeat Perkele though, you still succumb to your wounds, and your consciousness fades. And there you have it folks, that's Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. It was always a game I wanted to cover but, until now, was just too bloody intimidated by, which is still the way I feel about the first game, though it's almost certain that I go back to that one at some point and make a video about it too. Fear and Hunger 2 is definitely not a perfect game, and it has, has given me a lot of grief and pain, but at the same time, look, that's just the way it is. Even if I didn't always enjoy it, I still really appreciated the boldness of many of the game's design decisions, and how it's not afraid to piss you off or upset you because, for as irritated as I often got when playing it, there was almost always a decent rationale for why some source of irritation was there, with multiple ways to either deal with it or avoid that thing. The fact remains so that I did have to try really, really hard to get into it, to the extent that it sometimes felt like I was playing a game that was punishing me for playing it, which is a weird way for a game to be, but was all the pain and suffering worth it? Yes. And apparently the game isn't even fully finished yet, I've even heard talk of another mode or two still to be added in, and perhaps another playable character, my vote is for Caligura or Pav. I have heard a lot of reports of bugginess from people, but I guess most of them were ironed out by the time I got around to playing it, because in over 50 hours of play, I experienced literally one bug. Though it was a pretty freaking big one, admittedly. When you first enter Central Preheval, you can catch sight of the Kaiser walking towards the Hollow Tower with an elite trooper behind him, which was a really cool moment that I'd never seen before, but the grin left my face when the trooper turned around and blasted me with his rifle. Really didn't think that would happen, ouch. Ah, well, let's assess the damage. Uh, what? I tried healing up to see if the game would let me, but no. The next time I entered into a battle, Osa just immediately died and game over. Other than that though, no bugs, though the game is rife with typos and grammatical errors and such, some of which really made me chuckle. This line by Tanaka on the train in particular made me laugh my goddamn ass off. But hey, the dude's from Finland and English isn't his first language, and regardless of the odd error here and there, the content of the writing is simply superb. Just like I said way back in the intro, I'm very much drawn to proper nastiness in my entertainment, and there's something about the stark and unapologetic way that this game does it that I find so compelling. That's not to say that it's horror and violence is subtle or anything, because it's really not, but there is a real boldness to it that you just don't normally see, and I guess the fact that it was made by the one dude has a big part of that, because there was no other person, or boss, or any other moderating figure there to smooth out the nastiness, and the result is the kind of content you will never, ever see from any modern day big studio. Too much money involved, and too many people worried about offending. Anyway, I'm at the point in the video where I'm rambling, that does tend to happen with these longer videos, and so I guess I should leave it there. Please allow me to give a final thank you to my marvellous patrons for supporting the channel. And on that note, cheers for watching and cheerio.